I am your host, Terrence Eccles, and this is the 16th episode of the Eccles Unlimited podcast. Today is Monday, September 23rd, and so I have a little bit different episode for you guys. I don't know. I know last week everyone was able to watch the Matt Turner interview. I want to thank everyone for listening to that, but this week we have a little bit different episode, a little bit different format. I'm doing a face cam for this episode, um, so let me know what you think. I have a few re- requests to do this. I finally figured out how to uh, finagle the technology to be able to do this, so uh, we're just going to get right into it today. Today is going to be my FIBA World Cup recap. So the FIBA World Cup ended a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was it actually ended last week, but um, it was a great World Cup this year. I was very excited to watch some of the games. Obviously, I didn't wasn't able to watch every game. I wasn't even able to watch every Team USA game. It was very good. Uh, we had a lot. We were able to see a lot more parity within the world in the basketball sense which is a good thing because now we don't have one team that's just dominating everything in Team USA. And so we had a little bit of a disappointing showing from Team USA in the World Cup, but, you know, we're going to get into that later. But uh, first and foremost, I just want to just give you the broad overview of the 2019 FIBA World Cup, if you're not aware. It took place from August 31st through September 15th in China, and it's a 32 team format, the biggest FIBA World Cup they've ever had. And I'm just going to get into our top eight finishers. I talked about the quarterfinals in my, uh, two episodes ago. And so the top eight finishers, it went like this Poland came in at number eight. Team USA obviously came in at number seven, with the Czech Republic coming in at number six, Serbia coming in at number five, Australia coming in at number four. France coming in at number three, Argentina in, with the silver medal, and Spain won the gold medal in this uh, 2019 FIBA World Cup. So I'm just going to go through each team and just talk about uh, some key points that they had and uh, what sort of happened from the quarterfinals on into the uh, in the last few games of the World Cup. So I'm going to start with Poland, who came in at number eight. On their first quarterfinal game, they lost to Spain. By 12 points, they were in the losers bracket now. So they then they went and lost to the Czech Republic by 10 points, and then in their final game, they lost to Team USA in the seventh place game by 13. So Poland, uh, they exceeded expectations. Uh, they were originally ranked in the FIBA World Cup as number 25 in the world. Uh, so the fact that they were able to finish top eight is very impressive. It, it shows to their true grit and determination throughout the tournament. I didn't really get to see them play. I saw them play a little bit against Team USA, but wasn't really too impressed by anything that they did or or anything. Uh, they didn't really have any NBA players, so it was kind of weird to look at the players that they had and really I it was hard to be able to compare them to what I'm used to seeing because I'm normally used to seeing like EuroLeague players, NBA players, college uh Division 1 college players. So I don't I'm not really familiar with uh the type of players who were playing in on that Poland team, but they definitely played hard. They played well enough to get a top 8 seeding. So uh congratulations to Poland. Uh they went 4 and 4 after finishing after winning their first games, first four games, so they ended up losing their last four games. Uh, they won against Venezuela, China, Cote d'Ivoire, and Russia. Uh, I'm sorry, they didn't play Team USA. So they didn't have any NBA guys. Their leading scorer, his name was Adam Wadzinski. He averaged 14 points a game. Uh, they did have three guys average 13 per game, uh, so that's pretty good to have you know, uh, balance throughout your team. You don't want to have one guy who's dominating the ball, one guy who's dominating the scoring, uh, because if that guy doesn't have a good game, you don't have anyone to score for you. So I think the fact that they were a balanced team is what led to their six success in, uh, throughout this tournament. So, uh, now we're going to get, I'm going to skip the seventh place team, team USA, of course, I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. And now we're going to get into the Czech Republic. So the Czech Republic, uh, they lost in the quarterfinals to Australia. They then went on to defeat Poland 
by 10 points and then they went on to lose to Serbia by nine in the fifth place game. So Czech Republic, they exceeded, they're another team that exceeded expectations. Uh, they were originally FIBA ranked 10 going into this tournament. So uh, that's pretty good that they bounce, were able to bounce up. Uh, but they play tough. They play fundamental European basketball. Um, and as the game continues to grow, I don't see why uh, the Czech Republic won't be able to produ produce more talent. Uh, one player that I was uh, exclusively, not exclusively, but um, one player I was really impressed with was Thomas Sadoransky. Uh, if you're not aware with Thomas Sadoransky, he's a point guard in the NBA. He's about six foot five, I thought, but they had him listed on the FIBA World Cup website at six foot seven. So he could be bigger than that. Uh, I I didn't know he was that big, but he's he's a good player. He's physical. Uh, he's able to shoot well. He's able to control a team, control the pace, and for his size, he defends pretty well. Uh, for a guy who's as big as he is, so I'm glad that he's able to keep up with perimeter players and able to guard on the wing because he's such a big player. So the what he's able to do defensively as well as being able to shoot the ball at a good rate in the NBA is probably why he's can continue to uh, hold a role in the NBA. And he really proved why he's a quality role player in today's uh, NBA because he's able to be that type of player who can switch into that positionless game uh, to where he can play the two, he can play the three, as well as handling point guard responsibilities. So Thomas Sadoransky, who was very impressive throughout this tournament, uh, he made his country proud. He proved why he's a quality player in the in the NBA and in, in NBA rotation. Uh, he averaged 15.5 points a game. He averaged 8.5 assists, which was second in the tournament. So he was able to get his teammates involved. He was able to help out guys who aren't exactly at the NBA level yet. I don't know if any of those guys will make it to the NBA level or if they have past NBA experience, and I'm just not aware. But he was able to, the fact that he was able to get his teammates involved when he's the only NBA guy on the team really shows to his true point guard ability and his his game, his game knowledge and the just his overall basketball IQ. So uh, shout out to him. Great World Cup. Uh, he made everyone proud. Uh, I'm glad that he was able to do that uh, because he's a good player and a good guy. So Serbia uh, came in at fifth. Uh, they're now ranked number six in the world. Uh, they they lost to in the quarterfinals to Argentina by 10. They then went on to defeat Team USA by five. And then in the last game, they beat the Czech Republic by nine to place fifth in this FIBA World Cup. So uh, getting into Serbia a little bit, uh, they have a lot of talent coming out of that country, which is why I was a little bit disappointed in their showing in this FIBA World Cup. I, I figured that they would do better. I didn't know. Uh, I, I didn't know where they exactly they would fall. I just thought they had the talent to finish top three. So when you talk about the talent on Serbia, uh, you look at guys like, obviously, Nikola Jokic, NBA MVP candidate, uh, Denver Nuggets player, one of the best teams in the league. He's an all-star. He's a triple-double machine. And with someone who doesn't have exactly the best body type and the best, he's not the biggest and most physically dominating guy, but for someone who, who is like that, and for him to be able to have his type of game, have his type of success that he's had in the NBA really shows to his true skill. So he's one of, probably one of the top five most skilled players in the NBA right now. I'd say he's up there with guys like Kyrie Irving, Stephen Curry, and his overall ability and his overall skill on the basketball court. So Nicole, they have Nikola Jokic. Uh, they have Bogdan Bogdanovic, who is a guard for the Sacramento Kings. He had a great showing this tournament. He played phenomenal he's able to score at a high rate and he's able he was able to show why he's a nba quality uh guard in in this day and age so i, I he definitely really uh proved proved to everyone proved to his haters doubters anyone who really doubted him uh who would have questioned why he's in the nba or who is this guy what is he doing he really was able to just show he I am that guy. I can play at this level. Watch me dominate on the international level. So he 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 definitely really showed out and showed that you know don't don't sleep on guys like him. Don't sleep on the Europeans who maybe don't get the same level of 
uh, awareness or the same level of exposure or glitz and glamour that a lot of these American uh, NBA players have. So they these guys can ball too. They prove that they're in the NBA for a reason. So they also have Boban Marjanovic. Uh, one of the funniest guys to watch. I know I'm a Sixers fan, as you can see. So it was great to have him on this year's Sixers team. He was very entertaining. He even hit a couple threes, which I was excited to watch. He's uh, he's one of the most physically dominating guys I've ever seen in the NBA. He's about seven foot three, two 287 pounds or something like that. He's huge. He's just massive with massive hands that can just palm the ball and he can dunk standing up and he's just a funny guy to watch. He's got a great personality. He has a great uh, report with a guy like Tobias Harris. So it's going to be sad that they're not together this season, but I know he's going to uh, really bring something to the Dallas Mavericks and they're going to have one of the tallest teams in the NBA. Now that I think about it with him and Kristaps Porzingis on the same team, both guys being seven foot three. So uh, I'm definitely excited to watch him continue to, to grow and develop as a player. He was able to, you know, be himself in this year's World Cup. So it was great to see uh, him play for his home country in Serbia. So they have Nemanja Belgica, Belgica. Um, I know I just butchered his name. He's an, he's another player for the Sacramento Kings. I know he also played on the Minnesota Timberwolves. I'm going to have to uh, look up the pronunciation of his name. I tried to look up the pronunci pronunciation of his name, but I couldn't really find anyone saying it. I could find it like spelled out in the pronunciation way, but I couldn't really find anyone saying it. Uh, he had a decent World Cup. He, he's another NBA guy, so I just figured I'd mention him um, in his talents. So. And they Serbia also had guys who played top-level European basketball. So they have one guy who played for Olympiacos, uh, if you're not aware, it's the team in Greece that won this year's European Championship, I believe, uh, coached under Rick Pitino. Uh, so they have one guy from that team. They have another guy from Bet Fenerbahce, who's another very good uh, European club, and Bayern Munich. So the fourth place team was Australia. They are now ranked number three in the world. Uh, they've moved up from their number 10 ranking. Uh, that was, or their number 11 ranking from March. And they, they finally have a, a ranking that is representative of the talent and the ability on that team. So uh, Australia had a great showing in this World Cup. They started off really hot. Uh, they beat Team USA in an exhibition. Uh, so that was great for them. That was great for uh, their confidence and their ability. It really showed that it was great for their confidence, great for their fans, great for the country of Australia because they won on their home soil. So uh, good for them. Uh, in the quarterfinals, they beat the Czech Republic by 12, lost to Spain by 7, and then they lost to France by 8. So uh, good showing. Uh, I don't really have much else to say, but they're they're an exciting team. Uh, they, they have a lot of potential, uh, this group, and for the team moving forward especially uh, because they – what people don't realize is Australia has a lot of talent coming out of that country. They have Ben Simmons. They have Josh Green, who I've mentioned many times before, uh, the incoming freshman at Arizona. He's a McDonald's All-American, top five player in the country from IMG Academy, where they won the national championship. So definitely keep an eye out for Josh Green. He's going to be a very good player. They have Jonah Bolden, who plays for my Sixers. Uh, he's a bench player, but he just came over a couple years ago, so he's sort of trying to, you know, form his role in the NBA. Uh, he's about a four or five player, um, can shoot the three a little bit too, so definitely keep a lookout for him, especially at the international level, uh, being able to play that stretch big game. They have Dante Exum who is another NBA guy. He hasn't really lived up to the potential that everyone has for him, but I think he's uh, he's definitely has the ability. He has the talent. He has the size to continue to grow. I know it didn't, it wasn't amazing in Utah. He showed glimpses and flashes of being a quality player, uh, but hopefully he gets an opportunity down the road and hopefully he's able to, you know, finally reach that potential that he had because I like him. He's an exciting player. He's got the length. He's got the athleticism. He's got the skill to play well at this level of the NBA. So I, I'm just hoping for the best for him. I know that he's going to continue to work uh, to get to where he wants to get. And um, another guy 
who plays for the University of Virginia, just won a national championship, by the way. He's going into his sophomore year, who we should probably keep an eye on for Australia. He plays on the under-18s, the under-19s, under-20s, whatever. Uh, but hopefully he'll get a chance with the men's national team eventually down the road. His name is Cody Statman. Uh, I don't know if I just butchered his name, but he's, he's a guy over at the University of Virginia who's poised to have a good season this year. So we'll definitely keep an eye out for him. And with the guys that they already have, they're going to join guys like Patty Mills, Andrew Bogut, Joe Ingles. Aaron Baines and Matthew Delvadova. That's five guys. Australia can put out a starting five of NBA players. They're, they're the only team besides uh, Team USA who can actually do that right now, who could have done that in this tournament. But I don't think they started Bogut. I don't think they started Baines. Um, but, you know, those guys are still really talented guys. They have roles in the NBA. Uh, Andrew Bogut, uh, I don't know if he's still in the NBA. I'm not quite sure what his current role is. I know the Warriors signed him last year uh, to give them some an extra boost off the bench, um, in, especially when it came to playoff time. So we'll see what he does. But uh, from this Australia team, I was most impressed with Patty Mills. Uh, Patty Mills had a great uh, tournament. You know, he averaged 22.8 points a game. I thought he should have got on the old tournament team. Um, he was third in the World Cup in scoring. He, he averaged two rebounds and four assists uh, to help lead the team. But Patty showed why he's he's such a good player for that San Antonio Spurs organization. So I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm proud of Patty. Uh, he's he's definitely one of those guys you love to watch and you love to listen and listen to him talk, especially because he has that nice Australian accent. So um, We'll see what Australia has to offer down the road. I know that next summer is going to be exciting because I think Ben Simmons is going to play for them next summer. So we'll see what he's able to do. I'm excited for that. Um, but yeah, Australia, uh, you know, number three in the world now or number four in the world now. Uh, we'll see uh, what happens. So now getting into France, the teams that actually meddled in this year's World Cup. So uh, France is the first team since 2004 uh, to beat Team USA, the men's national team, in a tournament setting. So the fact that they were able to do that, it just really shows uh, how talented they are and how the game has grown all the way to France to where they have multiple NBA guys on their team and they're able to not only hang in a game with Team USA, but beat Team USA in a quarterfinal game. Like, I, no one expected it. No one saw it coming. Uh, they definitely took advantage of their... Uh, advantages, I guess. I don't really have another word, but they, they took advantage of what they had uh, in Rudy Gobert and Evan Fournier and Frank Nilakina, who made some tough shots towards the end of the game. I'm talking about that a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, Rudy Gobert, he did his things. He showed why he's one of the best centers in the NBA. Uh, he's not, He averaged uh, 10 points, 9 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. So he had a great showing. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of Rudy, Rudy Gobert. Hopefully he gets that all-star nod. I know a lot of people are making fun of him for crying when he didn't get on the all-star team. But when you care that much about a team and a game, like you really just let your emotions out. And, you know, your emotions can take you to wherever uh, they take you. So, uh, honestly, I don't see any problem with it. A lot of people were clowning him, saying he's soft and all that. Like, don't don't get on this dude. Try to say he's soft. Like, because if you checked up ball with him, you wouldn't score a single point. So I don't really want to hear that uh, coming out of people's mouths, talking bad about a guy like Rudy Gobert for crying. Like, it's it's crying. You know, it's not like he he did anything wrong. It's not like he he mistreated someone. So you know, don't give him any grief for that. Uh, definitely see him continuing to expand his role offensively. He he's already the best defensive player in the NBA, two t two time uh, defensive player of the year, uh, award winner. So, you know he's gonna continue to do his thing. And so Frank Nilakina, um, he was he had a good World Cup. Uh, his stats won't tell you the whole story. Uh, a lot of people have written him off, especially New York Knicks fans after they. Drafted him really high. They drafted him top 10 in the 2016 NBA draft, I want to say. Uh, they trapped, Or 2017 NBA draft, they, they drafted him top 10. People were saying that uh, the, the Knicks should have picked uh, 
Donovan Mitchell, or not Donovan Mitchell, but the Knicks should have picked, well, Donovan Mitchell, who was in that draft, but uh, they, they should have picked a guy like Dennis Smith Jr. or uh, Malik Monk, who ended up going after him. So, you know, I don't see a huge issue with it because of the fact that Frank Nilakina is 21 years old. Don't write this guy off yet. He's 21, okay? And he made he made a couple of tough jump shots against Team USA in that game. So don't write him off yet. Don't try to say that he's not there. Don't say he's a bust. I don't want to hear anything until he's at least like 23, 24 years old to where he's developed his body. He's developed his game a little bit more. He has a few more years in the NBA under his belt. And, you know, just don't don't write him off yet. Don't don't be so quick to judge him and say bad things about him. It's not worth it. OK, just let him continue to grow and develop as an NBA basketball player. So uh, he, he was impressive. Uh, he, he scored double digits in their quarterfinal and their semifinal game, the two most important games. Uh, so I was proud to watch him uh, be able to go out there and compete with guys on Team USA because those are the guys he's going to have to compete with in the NBA. So if he could keep this up and be more consistent in the NBA, I, de- I definitely can see him having a long and uh, prosperous career in the league. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Evan Fournier, who had a great tournament. He was an all-tournament selection. Uh, he had 20 points, four rebounds, three assists the game. Um, like I said, all-tournament team. Solid player for the Orlando Magic playoff team. Uh, We'll see what they're able to do this coming year. They have a few more pieces uh, this year. So I'm excited to watch them continue to grow and develop as a young team. Uh, They were able to get one win against the Toronto Raptors. So you never, they won at Toronto. Some Golden State can't really say, oh, they won one game. But like I said, they won at Toronto. So, um, like, the, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see with the Magic. We'll see what they're going to do this year. Uh, So the next team I'm going to talk about is Argentina. And basically, uh, when you think about Argentina, you just have to think about, you think about Manu Ginobili, of course, but he's retired, didn't play. I think he should have played. Like, he's probably still in decent enough shape to uh, give them a few buckets here and there. Um, But he didn't play. Uh, they had Luis Scola on their team, and Luis Scola had himself a tournament. So uh, they, in, they were, in my opinion, they were the biggest surprise of this year's People World Cup with their second place finish. Because who would have thought uh, Argentina would finish in second place? So uh, they beat Serbia in the quarterfinals by ten. They then went on to beat France in the semifinals by fourteen. But then they fell to Spain in the uh, gold gold medal game by 20 points so that's that uh, it sucks that they lost by so much in the gold medal game but at least they were able to put together two double digit wins uh leading up to that so uh, argentina basically like i said was the luis scola show uh, at age 39 the former uh, houston rocklet Bro- brooklyn brooklyn net was able to put up uh, 18 points eight rebounds and two assists so he had a great tournament. Uh, he's he showed why he's a great leader, a great player. He can still play at, and he can still play at a high level. He's playing. He's used to playing in China. He plays for the Shanghai Sharks now, uh, that team with Jimmer Fredette and all those guys. Uh, but you know, he 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 did his thing, and uh, he he got an all tournament nod uh, to show for it. So uh, he led his team to a silver medal finish, which they never probably would have expected coming into this tournament. So uh, shout out to him, uh, shout out to Argentina. So Spain finally got it. They finally won. So when people think about Spain, they think about the team that always loses to Team USA in these gold medal games after losing in the 2008 uh, Olympics and then losing in the 2012 Olympics to Team USA. So Spain uh, really was able to... uh, prove themselves and show that they were finally there. They finally had the opportunity and they seized the opportunity. And I'm, I'm glad for them. I'm proud of them. Uh, they've guys who have been there for so long, guys like Rudy Fernandez, who he's, he's past his NBA career. He's years past his NBA career, currently plays for Real Madrid, another very, very solid club in uh, the Euro league and the best league, the best professional league outside of the NBA in Spain. 
uh, but they also are part of the EuroLeague. Uh, but yeah, uh, Rudy Fernandez, uh, guys like Marcus All, Ricky Rubio. It's too bad Powell didn't play this year. It would have been great to see Powell uh, play, but they also had guys like Juan and Willie Hernan Gomez, uh, who have they've carved out roles on decent teams. Uh, I don't know which one is which, so I'm not going to try to say uh, Juan is on the the Nuggets while Willie's on the Hornets because I don't know who's on which team. Uh, I apologize for not uh, researching that earlier before recording this, but uh, you know Rubio and Gasol led their team. Rubio he averaged 16. Uh, five rebounds and six assists, which are solid stats, especially in Spain's system where they don't really let one guy dominate. Uh, they played that European style basketball where they share the ball and they share responsibilities. And uh, with Marcus Saul, he had uh, 14 points, five rebounds, and four assists a game. Uh, he's coming off an NBA championship, so he had a summer for the ages. I, kn- I already know. So uh, he's going to be. A, he, He's going to have to be uh, have a bigger role this year for the uh, Toronto Raptors without Kawhi Leonard on their team. So we'll see what he's able to bring to them, uh, especially after what he's able to do in this World Cup. I think that he can try to emulate that with Kyle Lowry this season and see if they can, you know, have some success. You know, they're, they're going to go in as the underdog this year. So we'll see if Toronto is able. I know that they're a playoff team, but we'll just see if we'll see if they'll be able to still uh, compete in the playoffs and. Uh, you know, maybe get back to an Eastern Conference Finals. I'm going to keep realistic with them. I'm probably, we're probably not going to see them in the finals again unless they get another superstar. So, um, you know, we'll see. So, uh, now I just wanted to quickly mention the All Star Five. Uh, we mentioned it in the last uh, podcast with Matt Turner. Uh, please go watch that if you haven't watched. But uh, the guards were Ricky Rubio, who also won MVP of this year's tournament, and Evan Fournier. Uh, the forwards were Luis Scola and Bogdan Bogdanovich. And the center was Marcus Gasol. So those are the all-star five, which is the all-tournament team for this year's FIBA World Cup. No Team USA players, um, even though they have the talent to do that. It just didn't happen, and you know, wouldn't expect it from a seventh-place team unless they had one guy who had amazing stats, and they really didn't, um, looking at their stats. It was meh. So now I'm going to just talk briefly about Team USA. So, Team USA. They were the disappointment of the tournament, and I know I support them. I support them through everything. You know, I was saying, I was telling everyone, oh, don't worry, they lost to Australia. Oh, don't worry, they only beat Turkey by one. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. They'll be okay. They've been through adversity, so they know how to deal with it now. They have Coach Popovich, um, but there's no excuses. You know, they're the only team in the tournament who had all 12 of their guys play currently play in the NBA. All of them. Every single player, from, from Kemba Walker to Derek White. They were all NBA players. They were all starting caliber NBA players. Okay, so I don't want to hear... Any arguments about that Team USA didn't have the talent and that they'll be fine once they bring in more talent? Because talent is not the issue, okay? When you have that much talent comprised on a team, you shouldn't lose based off talent. So there were other factors that led to them losing. There were other outside factors. And, of course, like talent doesn't automatically mean that you're going to win a game. But I don't want to hear everyone say, Oh, yeah, they just need their big, big dogs back. They need, like, LeBron and Steph Curry and James Harden. They don't need those guys. They really don't. If they want to play, great. We'll we'll take them. But they don't need uh, these top-flight guys to come in and save Team USA. They should be fine by themselves. They should be fine bringing in 12 NBA guys. It doesn't matter what level NBA player that they are. That is enough talent to win at this level, considering Spain just won with only four four or five current NBA players. So I don't understand what everyone are, what everyone is arguing about saying that uh, they just didn't have the talent this year because they had the talent this year. Okay, I don't want to hear any more disrespect about their talent or their, their lack of abilities on the court because that was not the case. That was not why they lost, okay? Uh, they All those guys are talented NBA players. They're great NBA players. They love playing. Uh, they're all bass. They're all hoopers at heart, and it just didn't work out this year. Uh, you know, guys like uh, 
So Jerry Colangelo came out. Uh, if you don't know, he's the head of Team USA basketball. He's the one who sort of uh, makes everything go. Uh, he came out and said he won't forget about the guys who dropped out of this year when making the team next year for uh, the Tokyo team. So if you, you don't know already, here are some of the uh, important, not important, but like the big name guys who dropped out of this year's World Cup. Um, so we have Damian Lillard, James Harden, Anthony Davis, three top 10 bona fide. Like you can't argue that neither one of those guys are top 10 NBA players. And so then you have like young, young up and coming guys like Devin Booker and CJ McCollum and other guys, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many guys who could have played for this year's team USA team, guys like Trey Young who got hurt playing in this for the select team. Um, but, uh, you know, we have guys coming up uh, through, through the ranks uh, who are very talented, some of the best in the world. Zion is another guy who dropped out of this year's team uh, with his busy media schedule and his he, him getting acclimated to the NBA, even though there was another guy who went number one in the NBA draft who ended up playing in the uh, Olympics right after that. And that was Anthony Davis back in 2012 uh, when he was just sort of trying to make a name for himself in the basketball universe. So I... I hate the fact that guys dropped out. I hate the fact that they want to load manage their bodies at this point because if you're about like as a basketball player, you just want to hoop all the time. And I get like taking care of your body and like wanting to preserve yourself, but if there's an opportunity to go on an international level and to receive coaching from Greg Popovich and play and and work out and to be with a team, I I me personally, I would never turn down an opportunity like that. I'm a different player, not an NBA player, not like an NBA caliber player. So I wouldn't know exactly what these guys are going through. But, you know, they made the decision that was best for them in their opinion. Um, in my opinion, I didn't like the fact that a lot of these guys dropped out, but it's whatever. You know, Team USA is just going to keep it rolling. They're going to keep bringing in guys each and every year who are more talented than any other country. Uh, Team USA is just so much talent in this country. So, you know, no matter what, Team USA is going to throw out a good team um, who's a, who has the ability and the talent to win. Um, so, you know, those are the guys who dropped out. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening next summer with the team. Uh, I know Steph Curry recently said he'll he he's thinking about coming back to Team USA. So we'll see if he makes that return. Uh, I mean, We'll see. You know, it's it's an exciting time. So I'm going to get into a few reasons why I thought that Team USA lost. So this is in no particular order, but I'm going to start with the Jason Tatum injury. It happened towards the end of the second game against Turkey. Uh, he rolled his ankle. He had a high ankle sprain. So he he's not he never came back, only played two games. He averaged ten and a half points. I think he averaged seven and a half rebounds, so he played well. Like he was looking good. I really like Jason Tatum. I think he's going to. He just needs a little bit more time. He was overrated at first. He needs a little bit more time to grow and develop his game. I know he has a good work ethic. I know he's under that Kobe Mamba mentality school. I know he's uh, he's with the Jordan brand, so he has a great mentor in Michael Jordan. So. I'm looking forward to watching him continue to grow and develop his game to where he's an NBA All-Star. I was also impressed by Donovan Mitchell, um, but we're not to sidetrack. We're, we're going to uh, stick with the reasons why they lost uh, before I talk about Donovan Mitchell and why I think he's going to be a top 10 NBA player soon. So uh, they didn't trust their bigs. A lot of times, Team USA, if you watch, you go back and watch throughout this World Cup, they went small. They decided to put Harrison Barnes at the five, and they played small ball. And a lot of times I like that. Uh, it, but against a team like France, you can't do that. Against a team like Serbia, you can't do that. They have bigs. They have NBA NBA bigs. Some of the best bigs in the NBA uh, in Rudy Gobert and Nikola Jokic, respectively. So you can't play small ball against those guys. You need guys who are going to be able to match up and size with them. So... The reason why I think Coach Pop didn't go with his bigs as often as I thought he should is probably because he didn't he didn't trust them. He didn't think they were talented enough. And well, in my opinion, I believe Mason Plumlee, Miles Turner, and Brooke Lopez are good enough players to be able to play quality minutes in a FIBA World Cup game. I just think they just need more confidence. And 
I, I don't know if they just didn't have, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not Coach Popovich. I'm no basketball genius like him. I'm not able to run an organization like he is. So I don't know why he did that. But, you know, I just, just from the outside looking in, I don't think that they did well uh, in managing their bigs. I thought that the bigs should have played a little bit more. I wanted to see them out there a little bit more and to be able to contribute to this team better. They didn't really have any true power forwards either, if you think about it. Harrison Barnes is a bit of a power forward, but he he was often playing out of position, uh, playing the five, but uh, I, they played Chris Middleton at the four a little bit, uh, but I, I don't know. Uh, we'll, I'm not going to really talk much X's and O's about why they lost because, uh, you know, it, we there could be a million reasons why they should have did this, they should have did that. In retrospect, they're probably talking about that, thinking about that. Pop is probably already has devised an entire plan for what he's going to do in next year's Olympics. So definitely we'll see what happens with them down the road. Um, but they just l- had a, another reason why they lost is just their lack of experience in the setting. They didn't have enough players who had played at this level and played in this setting like Harrison Barnes, obviously, who has played here. Uh, but guys like Kemba Walker, Jason Tatum, Donovan Mitchell, the real leaders of the team, the, the leaders on the floor of the team, they are not NBA players. Or they they were not NBA players uh, the last time that there was a FIBA World Cup. So they're not used to playing in that setting. They're not used to playing in the international setting for Team USA. And a lot of those guys were just like guys with it that they – Went into training camp. They thought, oh, I'm going to help out the team. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll get like an end of the bench roster role. Guys like Joe Harris, who went in looking like that. And then Joe Harris ended up being a starter by the end of the World Cup. So he, you throw him, he goes from that mental setup to that mental, to the mental setup to where he has to be a starter. He goes in as, oh, I'm not going to really play that much uh, in training camp. I'm just going to go there, get the experience, learn from pop. But then he has to start. You're telling him he has to start and he has to produce and he has to play well. I thought Joe Harris had a decent World Cup, uh, hit some shots, played some good defense, had that weird call at the end of the Turkey game where he got like an intentional foul uh, call. But uh, well, I don't know. I, I obviously love Joe Harris. University of Virginia men's basketball player, uh, three-point championship uh, winner for this past NBA season, uh, three three point percentage winner for this past NBA season. So he's definitely a, a guy that you can rely on to shoot well. And so another reason is the increase in competition. So other countries are becoming more and more athletic. They're becoming more and more dynamic, and they're becoming more and more talented. So. Uh, you know, they they bring more talent to the table. They bring more t- uh, experience than Team USA. So that's probably what hurt them too. And then it's hard to fit all those guys in last minute. It's just hard, um, you know, but I'm still optimistic for next year in Tokyo. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, he's very impressive. He he makes me optimistic. Jason Tatum, he makes me optimistic. Uh, you know, the, the allure of having another big name guy come in and, you know, we'll see how Team USA is able to deal with this adversity. You know, it's it's very important to deal with adversity as a basketball player. It's very important to get through that and develop it and to grow uh, as a basketball player. So we'll see how this team is able to grow uh, in the future. We'll see who's able to make the sacrifices for this country to win. And I'm looking forward uh, for next summer. Uh, so thank you for listening to this was my FIBA World Cup recap. <laughs>